Here, Judy. Oh, Thank you. And you're welcome. I knew it sounded a little weird there, but... Okay, so... Uh, Last week we talked about the the how 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 you know faithful God is, and uh, we we praise Him and we do hallelujahs. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for so many things, uh, but there is suffering, right? There's suffering that comes with this. Uh, you know, amens and hallelujahs are fine. And I am all for those. Because they exalt our king. And they're great. But there's an enemy out there. There's an enemy out there that wants to take care and deceive us. Get our joy all kinds of things to us. So we, we have to be prepared uh, for, for those times. God gives us a way out. And uh, so I'd like to, uh, I'd like in that vein, uh, especially in today's generation, 2,000 years ago, there was Penn's a phrase that said, the crooked and vile generation. The crooked and corrupt generation. Well, it's not much different. And I'm not sure it's gotten any better. It's got probably gotten worse. And it probably is going to get worse. In that vein, I think we need to all be prepared. Uh, I know those that are here and those that are uh, watching, I am completely confident that they are prepared. I, I just am. Because I know most of you. But we need to be reminded of what to be prepared with. So I'd like to start a series tonight. It's a six-part series on the armor of God. It's uh, something that we've been taught since we were little kids, right? In all kinds of different fashions. Little board and you put the little pieces of the Roman soldiers, you know what I mean? On the little sticky board and we sing the little song and, you know, onward Christian soldier, you know. So we understand all that. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's important to be reminded of what this again is about. So uh, I'd ask you please to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The last chapter of the book of Ephesians. This is going to be chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and by extension, he's writing to you and to me about spiritual warfare. We are engaged in battle with a spiritual being who is intent on our destruction. Make no mistake about it. We are fighting against the enemy who hates our God and who hates us too. He wants to devour our families. He wants to destroy our testimonies. He wants to devastate our churches and discredit, worst of all, discredit our God. But this enemy is not all powerful. He is not. We read in 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. We have something greater that's in the world. We serve a God who is greater in us than the deceiver that's the principalities in this air. While Satan is intent on our defeat, our Lord has given us tools to be victorious. The Bible tells us very clearly that in the end, 
God will have the last word and Satan will be forever defeated and banished to the lake of fire. In the meantime, God has provided us with everything we need to stand, to stand. And as we read these passages that I'm about to mention to you, keep an eye on that word stand. Uh, and he gives us everything that we need to stand for him. Uh, against anything that the enemy can throw at us. So, again, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, let's go to verse 10. I'm going to start at verse 10. Read along with me, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm going to go down <clears throat> to verse 18. Verse 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places wherefore take on you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there, thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What a mouthful. What a wonderful, wonderful statement by the Apostle Paul. The Lord has given us tools. To help us and our resources to enjoy victory in the spiritual battles of life. Now, remember, when Paul is writing this, he's writing this to Ephesians in Asia Minor, but he's in Rome. Not only is in Rome, he's in shackles. Not only is in shackles, he's in shackles. Uh, 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 he's in shackled to Roman soldiers, day and night. They kind of got a little familiar with each other. So he sees this guy constantly. He sees his belt. He sees his whole armor. And he's writing to these Ephesians and says, hey, hmm, I'm pretty good at parables and I'm pretty good at imagery. Let me use this guy. So that's what he does here. He uses this imagery as an analogy of what we face today. Armor has no effect in the armory. Right? Armor does no good until it is put on. Right? A Christian cannot stand against the enemy unless we put it on. The, arm, the armor also makes it possible to not only stand, but you'll notice it says to withstand. There's going to be blows coming. And to resist. They're going to push you. This armor also makes it possible to stand and to resist. What makes up this armor? Well, verse 14, you've got the belt. He says... He calls it the gird of truth. In verse 14, there's the breastplate of righteousness. In verse uh, 15, you've got the shoes. The shoes of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, there's the shield. The shield is what? He calls it the shield of faith. In verse 17, there's the helmet. He calls it the helmet of salvation. And then uh, in verse 18, there's the sword. He relates it to the sword of the Spirit. 
So each one of these parts of this armor have a very particular analogy, per se, that the Lord gives us as a resource. He says you got to put the whole thing on. Armor without a belt is weak. Armor without a breastplate is no good. Armor without a helmet, can't use it. We need the whole thing. We cannot do it alone in this battle. Wow, you know, I got my belt on, I got my helmet on, I got everything going on. Where is everybody? <laughs> Where is everybody? We're not alone in this. Christ goes before us. He fights alongside. God, uh, watch this now, God offers you and I the same armor He uses. In the book of Isaiah, we read in uh, chapter 59, verse 17, for he, now this is speaking of prophetic coming of the Redeemer in the prior uh, chapter, uh, which is Christ. For he put on the righteousness as, as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. 750 years prior to Christ's coming. Isaiah was already describing this armor. And maybe Paul. That's all he had to go by is the Old Testament. He goes, oh, I remember something as Isaiah said. Maybe I'll use that one too. But we have body, we have a Lord that's going to come with us. Amen. Making use of the armor of God really is becoming more like him. Today we're going to look at the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Having your loins girt about with the truth. Uh, we're going to cover the belt of truth and then we're going to go to the other ones in, in, in uh, subsequent uh, uh, Wednesday nights, God willing. The belt of truth. The standard garment... For a Roman soldier was a loose fin fin fitting t t a tunic, right? Uh, it was nothing more than a large square piece of cloth, and it was cut on each side on the top for the arms, and at the top for the head. And they just rolled it right over there, and that's how they hung out. That's, there was, it was a loose fitting tunic. Since most combat at that time was hand to hand, Giving the enemy such an easy handhold on this loose tunic would mean certain death. So before a battle began, the soldier would carefully gather the tunic around his body and hold it in place with a heavy leather belt. The phrase girt about in the Greek means fasten one's belt. That's what it means. Girt your loins. When he had to move fast or do some physical work, the robe would be tightened about the body so movement would be unhindered. The Lord himself told his people, be ready to go as well. He said in Luke 12, uh, 35, he said, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Your loins girded. We are to be ready at all times. Our spiritual loins are to be girded. We are to be looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't wear robes today, but we are to be girded up as well. Our girding is not physical. It's just not physical. It's mental and it's spiritual. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up your loins of your mind. The belt we weigh, we wear in our spiritual battles is not a battle of leather. It is a battle of truth. He calls it the, 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 the gird up your loins with truth. When Paul speaks of our being girt about with truth, he's referring to a couple of things about truth. There is the truth of God, 
There is the truth of God. And there is the determined act of using this truth. Ask anyone today, what is truth? <laughs> Ask anybody today, what is truth? And you're going to definitely start a very interesting conversation. Try it at a university campus these days. Just try it. <laughs> You're going to be received with laughter, scorn, and derision. The concept of truth has clearly fallen on hard times. And the consequences of rejecting it are ravaging human society. So what is truth? One of the most profound questions in the Bible was posed by an unbeliever. You'll, you'll notice this when, when I finish here. One of the most profound questions in, in the Bible was posed by an unbeliever. Pilate, the man who handled Jesus over to be crucified. He turned to Jesus in his final hours. He was being tried and he asked Jesus, what is truth? It was a rhetorical question. It was a cynical response to what Jesus had just revealed to him. And what did he reveal? I have come unto the world to testify to the truth. He is truth. During the Last Supper, Jesus says in the book of John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Further along in the book of John in chapter 17, 17, he prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We are sanctified by his word. His word sets us apart. Without a working knowledge of the truth of the scriptures, a child of God is easy prey for the enemy. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Let's not, let's not be deceived here. Have the truth. Gird your loins with the truth. He wants us to know his truth so that we might stand in the evil day. The Holy Spirit bears witness and counsel to God's truth. In John 16, 13, we read, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. I've got to go to my father. I'm going to leave you a counselor. He's going to speak the truth to you. And I've got a King James version for you. I've got a Schofield for you. I've got a Strong's Concordance for you. I've got a preacher for you. I, I, I've got the truth. But I've got the spirit that's going to give you a counsel. And he's going to give you the truth. You're not going to like it sometimes, but he's going to give you the truth. Without the truth, the saints of God have no foundation. And we can easily be led astray. The only way to combat error is with truth. At the beginning God made man and woman. Not 87 genders. While I was in the darkness, you saw my firmament. You saw me. 
I'm not going to abort that child. This is truth. This is a lie. My child is my responsibility. Our children are all our responsibility. The state wants all responsibility over your kids. School teachers are going to do whatever and do, say whatever they want to do. That's a lie. Those are obvious, right? Those are obvious things. He did it with Eve in the garden. And he continues even to this day. Satan is still seeking to alter the word of God, deceive it, contort it, just mix it up just the little slightest way. The Bible is, is God breathed, therefore it is truth. The Bible is reliable. I don't even know why I'm even saying this to y'all. You know this. It's reliable. It's accurate. It is to be read and it is to be believed. Those who read it and believe it soon discover that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly girded, thoroughly ready, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. The Bible is truth. It teaches all we need to know about life and death, heaven and hell, God and Satan, and sin and salvation. You put me in a cave with a candle and a Bible, and I'll tell you exactly what's going on in the world. Maybe not who, who what, or when, but I can tell you exactly what's going on in the world. The Bible reveals our condition as sinners. The Bible gives us direction and counsel to right living. It reveals his solution to our sin problem through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It reveals the way through, uh, of salvation through faith and not of works. It reveals the heavenly final destination of the saints of God. It reveals the final destination of the lost. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there's a sacred blood thread throughout the whole scripture, and it's Jesus Christ. That is the truth. That is the truth. The Bible is a book to be believed, to be read, obeyed, and even, yeah, loved. Love. If we own a Bible, we should praise the Lord for it. Amen. I've got four of them at home. There's people in China and wherever that are, that are tearing pages and folding them up, putting them in the back of their mouth, and, and, and talking to people and saying, pass it on. I've got four Bibles, and you know how many times, they memorize that page. That's true. We should soak in the truth. It contains daily, uh, every day. Let it shape our life, feed our soul, guide our steps, and it will lead us to Jesus Christ. The Word of God is truth, and in its pages is life everlasting. So, the truth is the truth is the truth is the truth. God is truth. The Spirit is truth. Jesus Christ is truth. His Word is truth. Now, we got this armor. We got this tunic. We're putting on this belt. What are we going to do about it? So what? What are we going to do about it? The idea of 
activating this truth seems to get to the heart of what Paul is teaching us here. Uh, he is speaking of an attitude, an attitude of commitment and preparedness. A determination to use the truth. For a believer, we gather up the loose closing of our lives and bind it with total commitment to the will of the Lord. Many of us allow the loose folds of our lives to blow around us, so to speak, hindering our walk with God. Like the ancient shoulder soldier whose loose tunic would allow this enemy to easily pull him down in battle, many believers allow the cares of this world to unfold their lives. We read in 2 Timothy 2.4, 2, uh, 2, No man that warreth, no man that warreth entangles himself. You get the, you seen the picture? You get the picture here? No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may be please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If you're, if you've got things going on in your life, and we all do, okay, and you expect that kind of, uh, of that kind of, I don't want to call it confusion, but that kind of thinking to prevent you from putting on the truth, uh, you know, the belt's going to fall apart. You're going to be a tunic and you're going to be warring with yourself. You're going to get all tangled up. When we are uh, girded with truth, we are walking with the Lord in total commitment and discipline. What good is a loin if it's not girded? What good is the truth of God if it is not applied to our lives? What good is His Word if we don't meditate on its wisdom? Knowing Scripture is profitable, of course. However, applying it is living by the truth. Living by the truth. There's putting on the truth. There's living the truth. Athletes in those days, they fought for something, uh, uh, you know, uh, for like a little perishable crown, you know. We fight for something unperishable. We're fighting for the very glory of God. We are to stand for Him on the day of battle because it's His will for us that we never fade away. We are reminded in 1 Corinthians 9.25, uh, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. They strive for the mastery. That athlete wants to go as fast as he can, wants to jump as high as he can to master and get a perishable crown. If an athlete can give everything just for the hope of possibly winning a perishable crown, how much more should we, the redeemed children of God, sacrifice to stand for Him? To be girt about with truth is to be renewed in the mind. If you have your truth and you want to apply this truth, you've got to change your mind. You've got to say, okay, I'm ready to go. Bring it on, as they say. Paul wrote in uh, Romans 12:2. And be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To be girt about with truth means that we embrace the truth as it is revealed in the Word of God. It means that we live out that truth in our lives day by day. The belt around a Roman soldier's midsection did more than just bind his clothes 
close to his body. That belt provided him with stability. It provided his back and his abdomen with stability. It was where all other parts of this armor hung. The sword hung over here. He had the shield over here. Maybe he had a hook for the helmet. I don't know. But it gave him stability. It helped him stand on the day of battle. When we embrace the truth of God's word, we will be hard targets for the enemy to bring down. In closing, uh, when our loins are girt about with truth, we will have been taking the first initial steps and taken on the initial pieces of the armor of God. It will mean that we will be true in our profession of Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. In some ways, living for the Lord is harder than dying for Him. Many over the centuries have given everything for our Lord. Thank God they remained faithful even unto death for the glory of God. And that testimony for us. Likewise, living a faithful life in obedience over many years is a wonderful thing to behold. It's a testimony to the glory of God. A life of truth bears faithful witness to the life-changing power of the gospel. It brings great glory to our God and the grace in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, 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 uh, we just, we love you. We, we need your help. We need your counsel. We, we need your Holy Spirit in our lives, dear Father. We need a renewing of our mind. We need the counsel of the Holy Spirit. We are, we are needy people. But we have tools. You've given us tools. You are a God of refuge. You are a God that stands. You are a fortress. So we do thank you for that, Lord. We don't go out alone. But let's recognize that it is a battle. Lord, we just ask you that you continue to bless your word in our lives, Lord, that every time that we open this book, that our plow goes deeper, that our understanding is broadened, that the spirit may bring a new blessing to it. Lord, I ask you that you bless those that are here. Lord, keep them safe. Take away any burdens that they may have, dear Father. Any unanswered prayers, please, uh, please honor that. We come to you, Lord, now as, as, as you know, we, we, we want to make our petitions. We want to make our petitions to you. We want to open our mouth wide so that you can, you can, you know, we, we want to receive your blessing, dear Father. Lord, incline your ears to us now as we continue in this hour of prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.